All right, guys. So uh, we'll dive into it uh, straight away. Uh, what we're basically talking about is something that's you know all around us. Uh, you know, we wake up to WhatsApp, we wake up to uh, Facebook and Instagram and all of that. What we start our day is with stories, right? So all the stories, which could be text form, which could be in video, and so on and so forth. We start our day with stories. We end our day with stories. And around this, I was having a conversation with uh, one of my friends, uh, filmmaking friends, okay? So does uh, film for Bollywood and theater and screens and all of that. And uh, he was kind of like, you know, slightly derisive about all of what we do and people around in the room do. Basically, he was saying that you have to right? So you guys, you know, you are not pure, right? So what you guys do is commissioned creativity and all of that, right? So you hired guns and all that, and you do what, you know, uh, is not lit really pure and all. So my uh, rejoinder to him was basically, you know, we coming here, the point of what we do is a lot of times very, very complicated, very layered. What we have to do is, like, at the end of the day, sell stuff. And in the process also sell, sell it through a story which engages people, gets people to, you know, stay with us a little bit longer. And guess what, even with that, 90% uh, of what we do is better than 90% of what you do, right? So I think we owe ourselves a little bit of pat on the back for that. With that, I will drive right away into uh, the, the panel itself and what it means to be an Amit Akali, a Pallavi, a Gaurav, and Mukund, and uh, you know, your own individual ways of uh, storytelling. Uh, how we we'll structure it is uh, a set of questions to all of you, and then we'll come to some of the questions which are individually to what you do, your kind of craft and stuff, right? Uh, so the first one, you know, I have sent you a set of, I will discard all of those, <laughs> right? Uh, my first question to uh, the, the, the panel out here is essentially about the kind of uh, storytellers, like what makes a great storyteller? And I have seen there is no one way of being a storyteller. There is, let's say, Durgesh of uh, Panchayat. He is rich with his storytelling because he's rich with the context. There are people like Gulzar who are great storytellers, who are great with craft and all that. What do you think is, you know, in your view, when you are putting together a team, when you getting somebody in for a certain kind of a project, who's a great, great storyteller uh, in your view? Um. I think in our line of work, and actually maybe in any line of work, ob observers, good observers are great storytellers, in my opinion, because, uh, and I don't know, am I the only person who does this? I'm sure there's many in the room who do. You sit in a restaurant, your friends haven't showed up, you're looking at the next table or three tables away thinking, what's their relationship? Is that a bad date? You know, how is this family doing? What's their dynamic? So looking at people constantly, because we're talking to people. You're selling, yes, commercial artists, like you mentioned, but I think it's all done through a sense of observing and making mental notes and tucking things away, you know, so idiosyncrasies. It comes from real people. Sometimes you can't make this shit up, right? It has to be real. It has to be things you've seen in people. You have a friend who talks a certain way, who reacts a certain way, who has a takya kalam. So for me, great observationists make great storytellers and great empaths as well, because we are in a business where uh, we hear it bandied around often, Addy, Addy come here, right? So I think a good storyteller, as opposed to a regular storyteller, needs to be an empath, because the more you actually put yourself in the shoes of people, the less you will strike discordant notes, in my opinion. That's absolutely beautiful, right? Stories are about people, and the more you observe people, the more you get their context, their motivations, what drives them to do a certain uh, thing in the story, right? Uh, your view? Uh, I think Pallavi has already, you know, spoke about the observer. And apart from that, I think uh, it's also people who are fearless when it comes to expression. I think expression is super important where if I want to tell a certain story, I'm not worried about on day one how people are going to perceive it. Rather, I want to actually be true about what I want to express. Uh, and we see that a lot with songwriters, especially in music. Folks like an Anuv Jain, Pratik Kuhat, very true in their own style of storytelling through music. Uh, apart from that, I also think that 
having a certain command over your mode you know of expression especially your format of expression is important for example if you are a short format creator who creates 30 second videos and having a good grip on the kind of graph or contour of that 30 seconds is crucial if i make a 3 minute song then i want to know how to how the graph of that song uh, you know plays out versus if i make a long format content which is 20 or 30 minutes in length i know i should have a good command over that mode or format so i think apart from the observers i would like to add this that probably the element of expression and the element of some degree of mastery over your your mode of of uh, you know creating your story is important yeah, completely yeah no so i i have a slightly different uh, take on this i think we're not in the business of storytelling only we're in the business of storytelling for content and i think that you know so so a lot of us are advertising people over here and suddenly the whole world has changed to content you know we were we were saying stories through films earlier through print earlier and suddenly you have to say it through insta and you have to say it through tinder and you have to say it through other platforms and i, I think i think what's helped me at least is you know being open i think that's that's one thing we need in today's day and age to be good storytellers in new formats so be open to new formats be open to new platforms be open to new technology be open to doing things the new way i mean for example when we did the traveling billboard you know we are used to shooting with uh, this is a traveling billboard for johnny walker and we we actually did this campaign with influencers and we used to shooting with uh, you know high end photographers spending a lot of time with them spending a lot of money on them and suddenly we had no control we were influencers who would shoot what they wanted to shoot they did a damn good job but we had to be open to losing control okay so so i think i think openness is something that will really whole good in today's day and age so yeah yeah uh, uh, the only thing i would like to add to everything that's being said is uh, emotional connect right like great storytellers have an emotional connect with their audience and i think you should go and tell your filmmaker friend you make a film you can make the audience smile laugh cry and that's it uh, i think the kind of emotional connect that we kind of kind of uh, have with the audiences you not just need to make them smile laugh cry but also need to act right pay their money like you know press a button so there's action involved with emotion right uh, and also i think beyond once you start looking beyond traditional formats of storytelling i think collaboration becomes a key like today you want to do a immersive experience you could have been the best observer in the world but without a great team of technologists uh, people who can bring that to life in different platforms it doesn't matter right so i think collaboration is uh, like key to like storytelling of today is what i would say so i think <clears throat> what i'm going to talk about is essentially a lot of times in in our experience in my experience rather i think the best storytellers are the guys who've had experiences right all the experiences that we've gone through and how we narrate those experiences i think all four of us over here when we kind of caught up this evening this afternoon we kind of talked about you know a little bit of the experiences that we have so i think experience really creates the best storytellers and i think in this day and age of content creation and how quickly we can churn out and create content i don't think the format is uh, is the key maker or breaker of uh, storytelling i think it's easier to kind of just pick up a phone and if you can tell a story using a mobile phone versus you know using a large format carrier uh, camera it does not really matter what the what the equipment is right it's about you know if you are if you have a great experience you want to tell that experience out you can go the experience how has to be authentic and it has to be some experience that you have and you can make a great story by telling and i think great some of the best storytellers are are telling stories of their own experiences no really uh, beautifully said i think uh, experiences and what we observe of the world around us and how do we transpose it to the brands that we are working with so that there is a greater story uh, which which pushes the brand agenda forward and gets connections from people uh, in ways that is much more than just a uh, product sell and stuff uh, you know what we seen in online uh, storytelling in the last uh, 10 or 15 years that online uh, social has been around uh, we seen the whole storytelling change in a dramatically different phase right so what started off with initially facebook and orkut earlier they were one to one kind of conversations right i'd write a post you'd have a, a reaction to, to to it and then it changed to where people would curate you know things interesting things that they'd seen and put it together 
to where it's become, you know, aggregation of a lot of voices, right? So there are people who are large influencers, there are people who've got a take on fashion and they've got their own narratives on fashion or home and lifestyles and life and all of that. Uh, so there have been like, you know, major pivotal points in how online has evolved over the last 14, 15 years. What do you think, you know, how do you, do you leave, read the tea leaves going forward, right? How, what is the kind of story that you think be emerging in the next five years, 10 years and how online storytelling is going to be changing? You know, you want to start from there now? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we were all used to the 30 second format and then you had the online uh, format and you had long format storytelling. Then, because of the change in platforms, you started telling stories in six seconds, right? And then somebody decided, I'm going to combine scrolling and video. And today you're telling great stories on reels. So I think largely, as, like, like what happens is, as technology shifts, people's behavior shifts, like, you know, how I interact with that content changes, and, and that kind of, like, changes our thinking and our storytelling, right? So I think, I think largely, I think it's dependent on platforms, and I think with the whole uh, Gen AI and all of that, uh, who knows, right? Like, you know, what's next? You know, it's so difficult to say what's next, like, you know, even six months from now, right? So I think, I think that's a very tough question to answer, but all I know is, uh, I think the next decade or so, it'll break down the walls of production, it'll break down the mighty big walls of budgets, and it'll democratize storytelling, like and you'll have the most diverse voices telling the most beautiful pieces, right? Uh, your filmmaking could be very, very experimentative, it could be very personalized, right? Uh, something could work, uh, even uh, you know, on a big screen, like you know, maybe films can be changed in a week, if something is not working for the audience, it can be changed in a week. So I think, I think it's more real-time, more personalized. A wrong room yeah. you were telling this in, huh? <laughs> that the story can be changed in a minute and all of that. There are lots of clients here. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, what you said, I just have a slightly contrarian view in the sense of, of course, it is anybody's guess where it's going to go. Uh, but I do think what is going to get tougher, especially when there's this explosion, and there will be. You know, exactly like you're saying, it, uh, there's uh, the kind of uh, timelines it takes for things to get refreshed, etc. are already shrinking. What is also happening is that people have woken up. So we've been living in an age where brands were talking to people. It was a one-way thing. Now people are brands themselves, okay. right? And that in itself, I think, is leading to everyone realizing that, hey, I can monetize this, yeah. right? And that is going to, the, the problem is, in my mind, that there's a large plethora of people out there who've realized that people are monetizing this. So while the formats will keep evolving and the number of voices will grow, I think keeping the brand alive and all of that is where our challenge will lie. Because the more we push, right, the further away our audiences will shrink. So I think in the, in the ever-changing format, like trying to not make it hard sell is what it's gonna get because people will get tired of being told to buy this, do that, from across the board. So that, I think, for the next generation of creators, yeah. and even for us, that's going to be a big, big challenge. Yeah, and I think not making it hard sell, but yet obviously selling, and yet obviously keeping it relevant to the brand, because that's what we're here for. But I think I, uh, I think the biggest change, really, and it's happened sometime back, is platforms, which uh, Mukund also mentioned. Because the consumer is, I mean, the consumer is living on platforms. They're not one platform, they're living on 20, 30 different platforms at the same time in the same day. So the same consumers on YouTube, the same consumers on Facebook, the same consumers on Insta, the same consumers on LinkedIn, and behave very, very differently. I mean, the same consumers on Spotify, and sometimes at the same time, and behaving very, very differently. So I think stories will need to be created on platforms. I mean, today a playlist, you know, could, could, could uh, a story could be set through a playlist, through an interesting playlist, and we actually did that. We did, a, did the unheard, playlist that, you know, uh, where, where we actually uh, uh, took playlists uh, and we removed women's voices from it. So the solution actually came through, you know, a playlist. You know, the, the, the solution could be, and that's, that's a music platform. The solution on Insta could be very different. The solution on some other platform could be very different. So I think platform first, and these platforms are going to keep changing. I mean, that's, that's I mean, there are platforms that are not, that we don't even know about today that are being created that, and platforms that we, know a lot about today that are going to be redundant 
But I think the idea would be to constantly know these new platforms and start storytelling according to these platforms. I think that, and that's an opportunity. I think that is damn exciting also. Uh, do you think, you know, in this entire thing, generative AI will make a huge amount of difference, right? It will play storytelling production in the hands of people. It's possible right now to just click and drop, create, you know, animation films. It's possible to have uh, absolutely stunning looking visuals and videos and the way, like, you know, Mukund, you said, the way it's changing. Every six months, there is a new generation of generative AI, right? Uh, do you think that will have an impact on the way stories are owned by so many more number of people, how would it impact, you know, the world of brands and how we tell stories? Will it take it uh, from, you know, the brand custodians like marketers and, and advertisers and take it to a next set of, you know, storytellers like you had the influencers, right? So a next set of people coming in, creating incredible stories on video through generative AI. Yeah, I think that ship is, sorry, sorry. No, no, go <coughs> I think so, that ship is sailed. I mean, I mean, Anybody can make content, I mean influencers, so I think it's gone, I think somewhere we are custodians and I think how we collaborate with people, how we use people, how we have ideas that those people can then create on, I mean it's not necessary to create yourself, you know, I think, I think that's the opportunity out there, there are lots of different people, lots of different tools uh, that are going to be creating for you and I think as a content, you know, as a, as a content head, what you'll be doing is really getting the best out of them and keeping the brand at the heart of all of that. But the other part of it is that I think it's fantastic. I mean, it's, 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 you can do anything on AI, right? And I think the level of create, I mean, you can just think it and AI can do it for you. And that's, that's amazing. And, and the difference will always be how we use AI. I mean, AI is just a tool, and, but it's an amazing tool. You know, like, like, like I think we created the first ever, you know, ChatGPT uh, uh, launch. Uh, this, was, this was in, I think, Feb beginning or Jan end. And uh, in Feb, we created a campaign where we created a character called Aditya Ayer. And we actually then revealed that Aditya Ayer on Valentine's Day, we revealed that Aditya Ayer was AI. Yeah. And every post of his, every picture of his was either, either chat GBT or, uh, you know, uh, 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 with Journey. But the fact of life is that, I mean, the idea had to come from us. So, yeah. Uh, there are stories getting woven around AI, what will do to humanity, to creation and all of that. Sorry, Yo. Yeah. No, so I think, I think AI is definitely going to aid the story, story creation and it's going to aid the creators to kind of, you know, probably research better their stories. But I think we just need to be mindful of AI when we're using it because it has cultural nuances, you know, you're throwing it into AI and you don't know what it's going to churn out, right? And, you know, coffee, copyright infringement for some reason, right? You throw something into AI and you say, give me, a, give me an image or give me a video and you don't know where it's kind of pulled things from and put it together. So I think we just need to be a little bit mindful when using AI, but sure, it's definitely a tool that's going to aid in the storytelling uh, build up eventually. Is what I think uh, just to, if I were so to add, you want to go ahead? Go ahead, man. Now, I think to some extent, you know, content creation is already pretty easy. I don't think anyone in this room struggles to make videos, but AI will become a big enabler and that will probably shorten the time or make it even easier for folks, you know, who don't want to use, say, a Final Cut or an Adobe Premiere or even an InShot or, say, a Logic Pro to make songs or videos, right? Um, but I feel that one of the most important thing is as a creator or as a brand to sort of maintain your tone or your character and the whole thing, right? Because what you're going to get is essentially what you feed in. And that's not always going to tell your real story out there. So there will be the human mind that will augment this and take it to the next level. I also feel that as far as video creation is concerned, just like audio saw this extreme explosion of, you know, folks who could now make songs sitting in their bedrooms. I mean, we are living in a, in a time where there are 200,000 songs released every single day. I think going forward, video is going to see that same level of independent creation at a bedroom level, which possibly today is not happening. And that's where I think linking it to the previous point, a brand has a tremendous opportunity to seed in thoughts where, you know, as she said, you don't have to create a, a story yourself, but probably there'll be a lot of notes, thousands or millions of notes creating stories for you. So I think that's a pretty interesting thing that could emerge. I had a lot of questions, but I think we have only about 17 minutes. I don't want to deprive the audiences of your individual stories. I mean, I know some of the work that you've done, been fascinated with it. I mean, it's a great, great opportunity for me and the rest of the audiences to get to know about uh, stuff you did and how you came about to doing it. You know, I'll start with Pallavi, uh, the campaign that you've done for Facebook called Puja Didi. 
uh, around the second wave of COVID. Absolutely gorgeous film. Uh, so if you could tell us, you know, the process, how you got to it, I don't care whether it won awards or not. It was a, it was a film that really moved uh, millions. Uh, your story behind the story. Yeah, thanks for that. I think nowadays it's honestly very difficult not to win an award because all year round, they're always, there's some, always something. Everybody out wants there. the Everyone. agency of the year. <laughs> exactly. <right. laughs> and that is, that is the reality. So if you choose to enter somewhere or the other. So I don't think, I, I think uh, the starting point is never, never an award, actually. And Pooja Didi, of course, definitely wasn't just me. There were a lot of really remarkable minds. Uh, behind it, Neeraj, uh, who wrote it, uh, Amit Sharma, the director. I think the basics, right, of where we started out and what impacted uh, the thinking stays the same as what I mentioned at the beginning, right? Uh, empathy and observation. We were living in a time where we were collectively impacted by the pandemic. Some of us more fortunate than others, we still had our jobs. And uh, in advertising, I remember when uh, the early months, when no one, no one knew what was going to happen. I mean, you knew that there was widespread panic. You knew that you were racing against the clock to deliver campaigns that people didn't even, weren't even asking for, just to show them, hey, I'm still here, you know, count on me. So I could only imagine, like, you know, when people like us were in that kind of a mad frenzy, the reality of people who actually were, who had lost their livelihoods. So in that sense, marrying that reality with the, with the brand role, I think a lot of us over here have spoken deeply about the fact that yes, while storytelling is exploding, formats are exploding, ways and means of telling this and getting it across to audiences are exploding, we can't lose sight as brand communicators and guardians of where our brand lives in all of this. And I think the social network, the power, the, if you come down to brass tacks, right, the power of a social network is in harnessing the collective. And that's exactly where the too late, so you know, it didn't even, it, it wasn't even hard sell for us. It was just organic. And I think the client team were really brave. So I, another thing when I was hearing everyone talk is it's not just about storytelling, it's also about story selling because you're only as good as the stories you manage to sell to people and, 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 and get out there, yeah, in whatever shape and form, right? It could be anything, it could be a reel and it could be a film and it could be a post, it could be anything in the world. So you want to be able to sell it, and I think our clients were supremely supportive uh, of, you know, a fact where you could just play out a story and let people live, and let people, it was cathartic. It was cathartic for us who were writing it, cathartic for the people who were making it, and I do believe cathartic for people who watched it. So in that sense, it was just, uh, I think, a sign of the times and a tribute to that. Uh, Pallavi, the story was also uh, richer for the nuance that it had, right? The context that it had of the place, the sense of place that uh, the film had. Paneer, right? So we will never write a film about Facebook and have Paneer as the centerpiece of that. So did the team like, you know, come from that kind of a background? This is something that you collaboratively did with? No, actually the thing is it just came from looking into a reality. I mean, the core of the reality, like I said, was all of us. There but for the grace of God goes I, right? Is what was in our heads. But who you show and what you're showing, I think we just wanted to get away from the world that all of us live in. We have often been accused that Bombay wale can't look beyond Bombay and Delhi wale can't look beyond Delhi, right? So get your head out of your bum and out of big city phenomenon and look at the reality of the country. We did speak with... You didn't say anything, right? But that was our, uh, uh, you know, Amit uh, uh, actually getting to Amritsar in the middle of the lockdown and them actually recreating uh, you know, the vibe of a lockdown when it wasn't actually, we shot it, you know, it was, it was just an, it was an exhaustive process, it was re really rewarding. So yeah, pan and why not about Paneer, like why is Facebook only for, why is it only for the good times, why is it only for Bombay projecting, no for projecting your best selves, right? So we went, we went real and I think it does help. Uh, I'll, I'll have the next question for uh, Mukun. Uh, the piece of work, which I know for a fact that had won awards. Uh, it's not like, you know, storytelling in the conventional sense of the word, right? The way you see a story, there is a protagonist, antagonist, and that kind of attention. But the whole story, right, which came from a little bit of purpose, I mean, of course, a lot of purpose, about uh, getting Unilever uh, to get to, I don't know what was the title of this, smart but film. where you got smart, smart, smart films. Film. 
right, to get uh, people interested in a new narrative from Unilever, which they may have seen a certain way, and the kind of effort that they have, the kind of initi initiatives that they are taking, with your help, of course. Uh, how did this idea come about? How did you operationalize it? How did you, yeah. you know, get the technology sorted and all of that? Yeah, yeah. multiple questions, right? I think, uh, so the tenets of storytelling are the same, right? Even if you're doing a product innovation or a film or anything, the core of it is, are you solving a real problem, right? And does that product have a great reader experience, viewer experience, user experience, whatever you want to call it, does it have a great user experience, right? And can you set a narrative around that product that can build a community, right? Say, for example, the smart fill innovation that you're talking about enables people to bring their own bottle and fill in a Unilever product, like a detergent or something, right? Uh, now, if you, it, of course, it's a cost reduction of 20% if you bring your own bottle and fill the one liter of detergent, right? But now if you set a narrative on cost reduction, does it build a community or not, right? So I think, I think the larger narrative was that of sustainability, right? So it built a community of people around the product, a core set of believers, so it's gone from one outlet to 12 outlets, and now it's being like rolled out in Bangladesh. So, so I, th I think, I think, uh, uh, Storytelling also comes into play when you have a tech product. I, I think it's not devoid of it, right? Uh, and, and just to give you a bit of a, a trivia of like how we made it happen. So, uh, you know, there are those oil vending machines, right? Uh, but the viscosity of the oil is very, very different from the detergent, right? So we had to, we had a start. We had like the oil vending machine as a start, but we had to like work with technology people. We had to work with people who understood the science of liquids to kind of like make that nozzle work for detergents, right? And also, and like, you know, what I've observed is if you're coming up with an innovation, and if that innovation tries to change the behavior of people, it's, it's difficult for them to get used to it or adapt to it. Uh, but if you're playing on existing behavior, like people are used to carrying bags to grocery stores, all they have to do is put a can inside, right? Uh, so it played on... Sorry, just yeah. rewind yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Uh, when, you know, figuring out the nozzles of this, the viscosity yeah. of this, I'm sure there were a lot of engineers needed. Yeah. Uh, did they come, you know, did the agency hire them? Did you speak to the client team? Get people from Unilever to get those engineers who'd work this yeah. out? So I think the prototyping side. was done by us and right. then we worked with uh, Unilever's vendors to like kind of do up the final one and roll it out to 12. Right. But even before that, to tell it works, right? I mean, we showed them a working prototype. But only asking because most of the times, agencies don't have the wherewithal to put this yeah. together. So maybe that's the shape of the new agency to come that you have a lot of technology. See, we don't have the wherewithal. Access to a lot of technology. Yeah, we don't have the scale, right? So if you tell, like, you know, I think right now we're doing yeah, something for Reckitt. Uh, it's an, again, an innovative innovation piece. We can do one. We are working with somebody to do one prototype, right? But now we can't do like 20,000 of those, of course. For sure. Yeah. Uh, Amit, uh, to, to you, Mukul, I think uh, you're absolutely right. The purpose of whatever we do is to get the brands to be loved by people yeah. a lot more. Whether you do it through the story, which is, let's say, a little bit more conventional, like a Pooja Devi story, or you get people to love the brand a little bit more if you're doing, let's say, even an activation, which people are really interested in and love yeah. the brand more for yeah. it. Uh, you know, yeah. either way it works. Uh, my question to you uh, is actually what happens when sometimes, right? I've been a victim uh, of a little bit of that, some of us in. Uh, a lot of times, you know, even if it's like 5% of people who don't like it, you're still talking about 5% of a billion and a half people, which is still a super sizable community and a lot of times they are very very vocal when they don't like what the brand has to uh, tell or sell. Uh, in your case you've done a film for Tanish which did come into I mean a lot of love right and there were five six six and a half person people who made a huge case about it right. Uh, I know <coughs> I've talked about this and I don't know there is any one way or two ways to make sure that your storytelling done with all the pure intent doesn't land up in a spot like that. But, you know, what's your take on it? And you shouldn't even try to make sure it doesn't land up in a spot. <laughs> because 
uh, you know, I think you're, 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 you're being true to the story. You know, when we did Tanish, Tanish was literally all our reality, right? I mean, I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Sindhi married to a Parsi. Uh, and, and again, I mean, I mean, there's absolutely, I mean, it was just a normal thing of someone from one community taking care of someone from the other community. And I mean, never would we imagine Love Jihad coming into the story, right? And uh, so you just make it from, you know, from, from the honesty of your heart and you just make it out there. And then whatever happens, happens. And, and I think the good thing is, or, or, or the truth of the matter is not even 5% who was against it. You know, it's a 0 0.00005% 000 probably. It's, a, it's literally 50 names, you know, which, which are doing it very smartly, doing it very professionally, literally attacking, I mean, sending out 40,000 along with a lot of bots helping them. So a lot of times it is also of course, it's motivated. Of course, it's motivated. Of course, yeah. Of course, of, of course, it's motivated, and it's literally a. So, but the good thing was that the rest of it, and it, because this is only 0 0.005, the reality is that that 100 percent people out there, 99 percent people out there, love it, right? And and they kind of rally by the brand when something like this happens. And we saw some amazing stuff happen. So there was obviously content that we created, which was the main film that that got then taken out, but for a film that got taken out, it probably created more love for a brand than, than anything ever did. And, and what was very interesting was, people actually made their own content to support that content. So there was, for example, there was a group of uh, Go Bike Tanish, you know, so this is literally happened, not by us, you know, happened by real people out there. Uh, there were my Tanish story hashtag going out there. There were people who actually spoke about their Tanish stories and about who they had given a Tanish to and their Tanish marriage stories, etc. There was a book that was created by someone who collected these stories. So there was actually content created out of love, out of support for the brand. And that's, an, that's a very interesting learning we had. So we went through the similar thing, actually, uh, 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 I mean, it's not as not spoken about, but the holy campaign we did for Bharat Matrimony, you know, so, so which, which was literally uh, uh, I mean, it was about the Holi festival and about women being abused during Holi, and suddenly it took a, this thing of attacking, you know, a religion uh, and not not a festival and not behavior of a few people, and and that was attacked. But but there was another con piece of content which spoke the reality of a Japanese woman who actually went out there and you know was abused during Holi, and that piece of content actually took the conversation away from this or to, to got the support for this piece of content. So I think one very interesting thing is, I think, do it from your heart, but, you know, some way content itself can be a solution to, to something, that, something that springs up. So, uh, yeah. Amit, I'm really loving your story, uh, but the person out there has finding no interest in it at all. He's gone to sleep, right? Uh, over there, right? <laughs> Couldn't help noticing. Lam! He's up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought he got to sleep. He had a long night. <laughs> Actually, I thought he was saying he's got to sleep. He's got to sleep. <laughs> well, I caught him in the middle of your story. Uh, so, uh, you know, Gaurav, my question to you uh, is uh, basically about, you know, how I've, I've read Martin Scorsese and how uh, he spoke about in his book called Making Movies. Okay, if you haven't read it, definitely must. Uh, the whole process of content and how m movies, how a story can be told fantastically, you know, given the constraints and this and that and the other. So he places music on a, probably one of the biggest pedestal after the story itself, right? And which is where you come in, right? He didn't pay that much attention to editing, which I don't necessarily always agree with. Music is something that he said that can change uh, the, the whole way people would, you know, get uh, the story or interact with the story or engage with the story. Uh, your take on that, right? So, and how does, how do you help brands tell better stories in what you do? So I have been a, you know, before I started Hooper, I was a music director for a long time, almost seven to eight years I was doing songs for movies and ads and so on. And uh, I realized most brands want to use music, but they often don't know who to go to except for a few music directors or composers in their circuit, right? Uh, 
So I started this thing, I used to, I created a network of about 100 music directors in Mumbai and I used to reach out to them and ask them, they unreleased kya kya So they used to give me, you know, I have four love songs, I have four motivational songs, I have few party songs and so on. So I started doing my own tagging around it and started creating this bank. And uh, I think 2016, 17, I had created a track for Double Mint, which was Ek Ajnabi Haseena Se, we had recreated for an ad, which was shot by Shujit Sarkar, that did well. I became friends with the Double Mint folks. And uh, they reached out to me a, a few years ago saying that, okay, we want to create this IP around music. Uh, you know, what could we do? We want music to be a part of our storytelling. And I realized that, okay, Double Mint stands for start something fresh. So, you know, we, we thought of an idea called Double Mint Fresh Take, where every story is about two people starting something fresh. And that's where that whole bank of songs started coming handy. I started picking up songs and we did a four track uh, IP with Double Mint. And uh, to, you know, sort of accentuate the fresh take, we had regional versions of every Hindi song as a fresh take. So that, that IP did well. We won quite a few awards for it, close to 100 million views on social media. But then we started realizing that brands want local and hyper-local music. And in, during the pandemic, we also had creators and brands reach out to us saying that, okay, like Mama Earth used to reach out to us, ki mere paas muskura hat hai as a keyword, do you have songs? Uh, Sun Silk licensed a song, Women Empowerment is my keyword. And we sent them a bunch of songs. And then we started digging deeper and we realized that, you know what, brands are using the same old Envato, Epidemic, BMG, which are not Indian libraries. And they need Indian music. You know, creators need local and hyper-local music. A guy like Ranveer Brar is cooking Amritsari Chole and using some generic EDM track. Why? You know, we, we need more of Indian music. So then we went out and raised some funds and we built Hooper.ai. And today it has more than 12,000 Indian tracks. Uh, and that's where that entire network of you know, musicians also came handy. We've got 3,000 musicians on our supply, close to 250 musicians contributing music on the platform. And now we are used by uh, Mintra for Mintra Studio, ZTV, HT Media, name the brand, uh, over 180,000 creators. So Ranveer is a client, uh, Tanya Khanijo, Ashish Vidyarthi. All of these guys realize that if I'm catering to an Indian audience, then why should I use generic music? I need Indian tracks, right? And the other window that's opened up is brands who take our subscription coming to us and saying that, okay, I've got your subscription. What more can I do with music? You have 3,000 musicians. Can I create regional versions of my existing jingle, right? And we do all sorts of experiments at, at our back end. You know, I, I recently took that close-up jingle pass out and I threw it to around 100 musicians. We got almost 40 to 50 different regional versions of that jingle, right? So there's a lot that brands can do with music. I feel that... Music as a vehicle, you mentioned at the beginning, yeah, Bollywood has used it really well. There are films you remember even today or actors who have maintained their stardom because of songs, right? And I think brands and creators need to wake up. And a great question if you are a brand manager who has got his or her storytelling in place or positioning in place is you got to ask yourself, what's my soundtrack as a brand? You know, do you have a soundtrack? Do you think of what's my sound? What kind of music? If I were to make an album for my brand, what kind of songs would it have? Right, and that's, that's where Hooper is now helping brands, so that's what we do. Uh, thanks, Gaurav. Uh, Richard, before we close, a uh, quick one. I mean, I know that Connust has a lot of expertise in creating uh, branded IPs, the, the, uh, the media brand, you create a lot of those. Uh, I think a lot of brands today also are, in a sense, media brands because they own communities, they have a lot of people that they uh, talk to almost, you know, twice in a day sometimes. Do you think that they're doing enough, aside from just a conversation uh, with people, in creating IPs for themselves, which are storytelling IPs or branded content IPs, or what could they do to do a little bit more of what, you know, right. some of the amazing stuff that you guys are doing? Sure. So, thanks for asking the question. Uh, I think, you know, sure enough, some brands are doing enough and some brands are not doing as much. I think there's definitely room for a lot of brands to create IPs. Uh, let's just look at this journey of how these IPs got created, right? I think it all goes back a few years, I think maybe 10, 15 years, when there were limitations for the alcohol companies to kind of actually create and, uh, and connect with their audiences. So they created surrogate marketing. I think from that surrogate mar marketing, it kind of led to let's create some sort of a content. So we had surrogate CDs, cassette CDs, et cetera, right? Music companies. And then eventually it went to let's create content that can actually talk to our audiences. So we tapped into the culture of what the audience really wants. Eventually that culture is what brands really want to connect with 
and use content to you know shape that culture in some way right once that culture is shaped they want to help bring bring people together and build communities so we've done it a few times i think we do it all the time with some of our brilliant properties like the forces of fashion that just happened and the met gala uh, but we've also built something for uh, uh, an alcohol company called diageo uh, called walkers in co which is essentially a community building exercise where we've kind of you know through the through the power of content we've kind of you know brought in a lot of people together uh, these would be sneaker community people who were interested in sneakers or in music and we you know so we had lola palooza where the brand was present and we've had a lot of like minded people who would show up and we launched a sneaker there that was for the sneaker community so i think you know brands are kind of working towards and brands need to kind of understand that when you create an ip sure enough you build the ip but you want to also the ip needs to have arms and legs that can uh, go the distance and bring the people together whether it's through content or on ground experiences and i think that's uh, broadly on well, thanks richard and we certainly must talk we could certainly do some things together uh, yep the board tells me the time's up and we may have actually overshot it i hope uh, it was useful or interesting for sure for you people i have been fascinated by some of the stories that these people have told i hope this was as fascinating for some of you as well uh, like uh, yuval noah harari famously said in his book sapiens uh, people i mean the, the the whole job of most of the brand is to give out messaging uh, but like he said people don't think in terms of messaging it's very easy for you to set out a message out there that's easy uh, people think in terms of stories right ki wo like bjp has done enough amount of development but what is their story what is the bigger narrative which is what people buy in similarly any other brand right so what is the narrative that the brand has the messaging in common and these are some fascinating way, ways of telling those stories i hope we have some interesting nuggets from these thank you so much thank you so much ladies and gentlemen a warm warm round of applause